So um, my name is Matt Williams and I'm a research software engineer at the University of Bristol. Uh, thanks to James and AWS for having us along to talk about Cluster in the Cloud uh, in this session today. Um, so Cluster in the Cloud is a piece of software which we've been developing here at Bristol in between other projects for the last year or two. So I'm going to go through today what the problem we're solving with it, with it is, how it works, and then have a look at how it's um, helping us do some benchmarking on the new Graviton 2 processors. So the problem statement we started with, we had researchers at Bristol who were being awarded cloud credits from various cloud providers, um, but they had no idea what to do with them because they were being presented with things like this. And this is not designed to uh, cast aspersions over uh, AWS or Google shown here. It's simply a reflection of the fact that the cloud is complex. If this is what you're initially shown when you think, right, I'm going to go and make a VM so I can have a little play with the cloud, people get immediately scared off and don't really know what they're supposed to be doing. They don't know what IAM roles are or egress only internet gateways. These just aren't in the terminology of the average researcher at a university. What researchers do know, however, is their field of research. They're experts in those things. This isn't to imply that they don't know what they're doing. They also know their language and their tools, whether it's Python or Gromax or Rely on whatever tools they're using for performing their research. And many of them are also familiar with HPC facilities. So most universities have some form of supercomputer or batch compute cluster. And so they'll be familiar with Slurm or PBS or other tools that are like that. And that's fine. We shouldn't be expecting them to be learning skills beyond that level. Having them uh, have to learn how to be a professional sysadmin is not a good use of their time. And this is where at many universities, the research software engineer role is coming in to provide that bridge between the researcher who are the experts in their field and the compute side, which we can handle and glue all of that together. So the solution we came up with was to give them what they're used to but put it in a cloud environment. Now, if you give them the right kind of interface, they won't know that they're in the cloud. And my experience with this is that people treat it exactly like the local compute resources. They don't know they're on the cloud, except that they don't have to wait in the queue anymore. And they only have to pay for what they're using. So it's bursty work, they're only paying during those bursts. Now, so the tool that we've created is called Cluster in the Cloud. Cluster in the Cloud is an automatically provisioned Slurm cluster. The majority of researchers that we were working with were comfortable and familiar with Slurm. It gave us the right technological underpinning to perform the things that we wanted to do, particularly around automatically scaling nodes up and down. There had previously been some work by Google a few years ago for getting Slurm working on their uh, cloud platform, which was still sitting around, but it hadn't been expanded much beyond that level. So we've plugged into Slurm and are using the technology that's inside there in order to allow this automatic scaling that we want to provide to our researchers. The platform itself of Cluster in the Cloud is kind of created in two stages. Firstly, we use Terraform as our underpinning orchestration tool. This sets up the basic virtual private network in the, in the cloud. It creates a shared file system, which is where the user's home directories and software gets installed. On AWS, this is using the Elastic File System, and there's a tunable there to choose whether you want the general purpose or the high performance settings for the Elastic File System. It also creates a single combined management login node, which is as small and cheap a shape as we could afford. So we use the T3A medium, and this is sufficient to provide the login environment and all the orchestration that goes on behind the scenes for Cluster in the Cloud. We've chosen these technologies specifically to try and find the the lowest common denominator and the cheapest, so that while work isn't being performed to do the research, it's not costing them very much money. So we're trying to make it something which they can just leave up running for the duration of a research project. And whenever they want to do some analysis of some kind, they log on and they think about only being charged for that time when they're actually performing their computation. The second layer on top of the infrastructure that gets created is we use Ansible, this is used to do the configuration management. So it installs all the um, bits of software that you need in order to manage users. It mounts all the file systems. It uh, creates the compute image, which is going to be used by the compute nodes when they're started. And it does all that firewalling stuff in between to try and make it 
a secure environment. So the key features of Cluster in the Cloud, as far as researchers are concerned, since that is our primary audience, is that it's familiar. So it's a known environment they're used to. So they've got Slurm with sbatch and sq and sinfo, all those co common tools. It also has plugin support, so you can, with one click, install a JupyterHub server, so that if you've got people who want to use something like Dask, they can log into JupyterHub through the web directly, do their analysis in Pandas and Dask, automatically spin up uh, compute nodes behind the scenes, and it will run the stuff there and then shut down again afterwards. So it's a nice familiar environment which they should be comfortable working in. It's also versatile. So as was alluded to in some of the talks earlier, one of the benefits of the cloud is that you've got a variety of different instance types, and you can have, in principle, arbitrarily many of any of them. So you can have combinations of instance types. We've used this to great effect with some of our data processing pipelines, where some parts of the pipeline need GPUs, later parts need very large CPU machines, and then later parts again maybe need GPUs again. So creating a workflow which goes through, turns on some GPU nodes, turns them off, turns on the next type, turns them off, and goes through that workflow, reducing the waste that you're coming up again. It's, of course, dynamic. They only start when they're needed, and they get turned off again afterwards. And as I was alluding to on the previous slide, it's cheap. So all you're paying for is the t3a.medium uh, virtual machine, which is very, very cheap, basically one of the cheapest that are provided by AWS, plus whatever storage you're storing in the Elastic file system, which if you're, not, if you're only using a few gigabytes, is again, very, very cheap. It's also cross-cloud. So if you are getting some research money from AWS, for example, on a grant, then you can create a cluster there. If later on you've got colleagues or another project which uh, is tied into Google Cloud or Oracle, then you can spin up the same kind of environment on those clouds as well. So it's the same consistent environment across all, except as you're so far, all of the major clouds. The way that it works behind the scenes, and this is why I've explicitly mentioned that it is a Slurm cluster for doing the job management, is that it uses the Slurm Power Management API. So for each of the cloud platforms, we have a Python plugin which calls the appropriate bits of the API. It says, turn on this node of this type, connect it to this subnet, and go away and allow work to run on it. All you have to do in advance is tell it how many potential nodes of each type you want to have. So you can set these numbers very large. You say, I want 100,000 of the C6Gs, 16X larges, and you're not going to be paid for them. You're just saying, I, I want to use as many as that, but right now, none are created. You create your configuration of what kinds of instance types you want, and they're not going to be actually charged for and started until you submit jobs. So when you do submit a job through Slurm, it's going to look and find the smallest instance type which matches the job you're asking for based on memory requirements, number of cores, and potentially any other features you ask for. Like, for example, the architecture. If you want an ARM architecture, you ask for that, and it's going to assign that work to a Graviton processor node. It's then going to start an instance, create one from scratch based on the compute image that was created earlier, start the job running on that node, and once the job's finished, it's going to destroy it. We have a little timeout before it actually destroys it in case you have a, another job coming in in the queue or you submit one a few minutes afterwards as a kind of follow on. So you don't have to pay for that minute or so of startup time. So I'll just go through now a little graphic showing that process. So this here is what you start off with before you've um, started running any jobs. So you've got your laptop at the top. You're not paying anything for the, in the cloud for that. That's just something you own. So all you're really paying for is the running of the management VM. And that sits there running permanently, which is why we try and make it as uh, inexpensive as possible. When you submit a job, it goes off, starts a node, runs the job on that node. You submit some more jobs of varying sizes, and they start running on their nodes as well. It automatically scales out as many nodes as you set the limit to. As each individual job or part of a job or part of a pipeline finishes, a particular node turns itself off. And at that point, you stop paying for it. And that's uh, the real beauty of the cloud-based batch systems. And once all your jobs are finished, they all get turned off, and it all disappears, and you're back to your minimum setup. 
So to show that a little graph of what this looks like, so in this next slide, I've showed a, a 40 node array job. So I've started up 40 uh, different jobs, each of which are requiring a full, um, full cloud node. They are able to run in parallel, but not doing MPI. So this is just doing a parameter sweep kind of idea. So at the beginning there, at three o'clock, there's no nodes running at all. At 15.01, I submitted the job and immediately 40 nodes start turning on. Well, I say immediately, there's a small uh, limit as to how many nodes you can request by default in a certain amount of time on AWS. So it's slightly tapered. Each node takes about a minute to turn on before it starts running the job. In this case, the job takes five minutes to do its little bit of work. Once it's finished, the node will then hang around for about another five minutes until it then turns itself off. So you are paying a little bit of overhead, both the spinning up stage, which is very, very minimal and as small as you can get, and the waiting for more work, which is a configurable parameter. So you could choose to turn your nodes off as soon as your work is finished and then not have to pay any extra. So you see there, the spinning up time is very short, only about a minute or so. Um, and that's because we're pre-creating the images and you can create custom images, customize them however you wish to have whatever software you want installed on the node before it gets started. As far as timing, a full system test takes about 17 minutes on AWS. And this is my full integration test, which checks that the software was working as it's supposed to. So it starts from absolutely nothing, no network, no management node, no nothing, creates a cluster from scratch, creates the node images, runs a test job. In fact, I think it might even run multiple test jobs, checks all the system is configured correctly and all the bug reporting and the monitoring is working. And then it tears the whole thing down. And that whole loop takes 17 minutes. The first stage of just going from nothing to running your first test job is probably on the order of about five to 10 minutes, depending on how busy the cloud seems to be acting. And I'd like to contrast this 17 minutes with how long it's taken us at the University of Bristol, and I know other universities, to uh, procure compute clusters for their institute. It's taken six months to a year easily to get access to these things, which means you're always a year to two years behind the curve unless you're very, very closely aligned with the hardware providers. Whereas with something like uh, the cloud, with cluster in the cloud, you can get access to the Graviton processors where the Graviton 2 were only released a month ago, I think, and they're already available to use in cluster in the cloud. So as far, as far as the uh, the pros and cons and the performance characteristics that cluster in the cloud is really designed around. So it's best suited to heterogeneous and high throughput tasks, things where you're doing trivially parallelizable tasks, parameter sweeps, lots of different experiments with different size uh, compute nodes, um, throwing jobs out there and just waiting for the results to come back. Also works really well for pipelines where you've got different chunks of your process needing different kinds of hardware so you can choose exactly the right size node for each part of your analysis flow. It's really nice because compared to a traditional on-premise cluster, you'd normally have one, maybe two different hardware types. All your nodes will have 28 cores or all your nodes will have 52 cores. You won't have any flexibility there. With the cloud, you can choose exactly the right size for exactly the right task. And as I said before, you always have access to the latest hardware. So you get access to Graviton 2, well before any on-premise cluster has access to similar hardware, or at least before most have access to similar hardware. There are, of course, other um, ARM clusters out there, but they're not readily available for every institute to have access to. At the moment, our focus hasn't been on multi-node, large HPC um, scaling MPI workloads. Primarily, it's because our focus and our users have been mostly on the high throughput side, but a lot of the cloud work that's been done recently is going to make this hopefully really easy to add in. So for example, the elastic fabric adapter should be a nice easy thing. We just enable it when the nodes get started and they immediately have access to the fast interconnect. It's just a case of us working out how that's going to be configured behind the scenes. And there's a few other technological barriers which are in the way, which I'll come back to in a little bit. Um, but once those are knocked down, we're hoping to have EFA available on AWS so you can do all the nice, fast MPI stuff that we've been talking about so far today. It's also really great for teaching clusters. So you can just spin up a small Slurm cluster and teach people how HPC works in a safe environment where you can restrict how much money that gets spent. 
You don't have to worry about it competing with your real research work. And you can tune and play around with things to make this work just for the class that you're teaching, for example. It also works really well for benchmarking. So my colleague Chris Adsall has been hard at work uh, doing benchmarking over the last few days and the ability to spin up all these different node types, running your code across all of them and then having them shut down again afterwards is a really, really powerful thing to have. So going back to um, what Brian was saying about testing whether your stuff's going to work on the Graviton 2, something like Cluster in the Cloud is really good for that because you can just send off test jobs and see how it's performing and if there's any runtime errors. It also works really well for sort of mid-scale, medium data um, tasks, things like Spark and Dask, scaling your compute across a node or two, or just having access to a large single node with a lot of cores or a lot of memory behind the scenes to run your analysis on. Also, it supports things like Singularity, so you can package your apps up in Singularity. As long as they're built for the ARM64 architecture, they're going to run without problem on the Graviton2 nodes. So I'll talk a little bit now about uh, who, who's used it at Bristol and outside. So there's two particular projects that have already had research published, having used Cluster in the Cloud to provide the backend compute for their work. So there's a group of Bristol who are doing smoking cessation work. So this is effectively doing molecular dynamics, running on hundreds of nodes, but each node running their own individual jobs. They're not doing inter-node communication. This allowed the run times to get down from something like months, which would it would be on a local HPC machine, down to a single week because we could scale much, much more broadly by running things on the cloud. Secondly, a vaccine delivery project. So this was looking at cryo electron microscope images of uh, vaccines and virus particles. And by creating a pipeline which uses GPUs and CPUs at various stages, we brought the cost down and allowed that iterative research to be done a lot more quickly. And other projects that have been going on, so in the last few months, of course, COVID research has been picking up and everyone's been very interested in helping out with that how they can. We've got several research projects at Bristol using Cluster in the Cloud to provide the compute backing for their uh, COVID research. And there's a whole bunch of other projects, um, like dynamics, carbon sequestration, and radiotherapy research using this. So it's really a cross-domain tool allowing researchers to just focus on the things that they care about in a familiar environment. Uh, there's a question there, is there any kind of persistent storage on the cluster in the cloud? Do users get a home directory? Yes, they do. So this is stored on the Elastic file system on AWS. So it's not a high performance file system, but it's plenty um, appropriate for the kind of workload that we're looking at. So they get a home directory, and that's also where you can share app installations across the cluster. So you can use something like EasyBuild or SPAC to install your software into the shared file system, and that persists for the lifetime of the cluster, even if the individual nodes get turned off. So onto the uh, message of the day, the Graviton. So Cluster in the Cloud supports all of the Graviton 1 and 2 instances, all of the A1s, the Ms, the Cs, and the Rs. Uh, and that includes both the virtual machines and the bare metal types. Um, we've been very hard at work since the general availability of the Graviton 2 just over a month ago to get everything ready to show it at the workshop today. So it is in the released and available version of Cluster in the Cloud. You can create a cluster and in the documentation it explains the extra little step to get the ARM image built up. But apart from that, all you have to do is tell it in principle how many of each type of node you want to limit yourself to. So for example, here I'm saying I only want, I, I never want more than 100 C6Gs for x larges, likewise for the other two node types. You put that in a small YAML file and that sets your limits. Once that's done, in order to run a job on one of the Graviton processors, you simply need to add a dash dash constraint flag to your sbatch command and tell it what the architecture you want to run on. And based on that, Slurm is automatically going to find the smallest but will still fit the job you're submitting and make sure it's running on the correct architecture. You can also specify specifically that you want maybe an r6g.metal um, instance type with a similar kind of constraint core. This allows easy um, benchmarking and comparisons to be done across your, uh, across your workloads. Um, and this is, for example, how we've done our benchmarking by creating a cluster with all these different instance types <clears throat> and submitting a bunch of jobs with all these different constraints. 
Elastic Fabric Adapter. This is a much uh, simpler and shorter story because we don't support EFA just as yet on Cluster in the Cloud. Um, it hasn't been the focus of our work, but it is something that we want to add in. Um, as Brian was saying, it's not supported on the latest Graviton processors yet, but there's no reason why we can't add it in for the support for the traditional Intel style um, processors that are available on AWS. The other thing that's holding us up at the moment is that EFA doesn't support CentOS 8, as I understand it. CentOS 8 works fine with the Gravitons, but EFA doesn't seem to work with CentOS 8 yet, or at least according to the documentation, that's the case. I haven't actually tried installing the packages and see what happens, but as documented, um, CentOS 8, which is what we use, isn't supported for EFA. But once it is all there and running, which I hope would happen sometime in the next year, it will just be a case of start up a particular instance type, which is supported by EFA, and the um, in, uh, network interface will automatically be attached to those nodes and you'll get that nice, fast interconnect. So I've just got a few more benchmarks to show and then I'll be done. So um, I did a few benchmarks myself and I must admit I am not a HPC expert. I'm not a benchmarking expert, but the sort of work that I do is generally running Python scripts on uh, to, do, to do data analysis. And so I wanted to get a sense for my workload what kind of difference we're going to get. And so comparing the Graviton 1 to the Graviton 2, on the C, which is the compute optimized uh, Graviton 2 uh, line, we get almost twice the performance per dollar. So it is more than twice as fast, but they are slightly more expensive. But the price difference is well worth it. If you're still on the A1s moving to the C6Gs, you get a lot more performance. And even the memory optimized, the R6Gs, which are a lot more expensive, are still better value money, better value for money than the Graviton 1s. So it is still worth moving on to the Graviton 2s if you are using Graviton 1s at all. So this was single core, small something dot medium uh, benchmarks I ran. Now, my colleague Chris Hetzel um, has been hard at work over the last few days um, getting some proper benchmarks run on the Graviton using our University of Bristol HPC benchmark um, package, which is uh, maintained by the HPC group here at the University of Bristol, um, led by Simon McIntosh Smith. And this is a package of a whole bunch of different types of HPC appropriate benchmarks. So we've got some synthetic benchmarks, some small design for this kind of thing, mini apps, as well as some full apps which are used for real research. Things like Gromax, for example, is one that we'll be showing today. So this is hopefully going to show realistic workflow and uh, performance differences that you could actually expect if you're using research code in a HPC environment by looking at um, the thing that Graviton2 can provide. So I'd like to say thank you again to Chris Edsall for uh, doing all the work on these benchmarks. All I've done is turn them into graphs and stick them in a slide. So all the kudos goes to him. So starting off with uh, the question you get a lot when people are asking about virtual machines, um, does the virtual machine have a big overhead which wastes all your money and you don't get as much performance out of it? So we wanted to look at, on the Graviton 1, the difference between bare metal and a equal size virtual machine. So this is a virtual machine which is filling the bare metal instance. And we're seeing less than a percent, less than half a percent really performance difference. So I would say for the simplicity, for the fact that the nodes start significantly faster, it is definitely worth going for the virtual machines here. You just get a nicer, smoother workflow with the virtual machines and the performance difference is so small, I don't think anyone is ever going to notice, even if you're running very, very large simulations. So that's the first thing. So from now on, I'm going to be comparing virtual machine for virtual machine, assuming that the bare metal difference isn't significant in any of the upcoming uh, benchmarks that we show. I would also like to say, because Chris asked me to, is that all of these results we're showing here are provisional. None of these are publication quality. These are things that Chris has kindly put together in a very short period, and these are the first results we've had on this. So these aren't for um, talking about how great or awful things are. These are a, a demonstration of what we are seeing at the moment, rather than anything necessarily completely rigorous. So next question you have is, how does the Graviton 1 compare to the Graviton 2 on a real benchmark? So the blue here is a normalized Graviton 1, so it's always set to 1. 
and if the orange bar is bigger, then the orange, then the Graviton 2 is better. So you see across both the synthetic, the mini apps, and finally the full application, the Graviton 2 is always better. In all these cases, it's at least twice as good. In the synthetic benchmark, it was much, much better. Obviously, that's why we flagged that one as a synthetic benchmark, because you should always be comparing synthetic and real applications when you're looking at benchmarking. But regardless, we're getting more than two times performance across the board. And these nodes don't cost twice as much. So you're getting better value for money by moving from the Graviton 1 over to the Graviton 2. So these here will run on the 4x large, which I think are 16 cores. So you're seeing uh, good scaling across them and it's all working correctly. Third and final benchmark I wanted to show is show how the Graviton 2 compares to the other compute focused instance types like the AMD Epic, which is good performance, but also very inexpensive comparatively until now it was the probably one of the best um, performance per dollar that the, the cloud providers had. So looking at the AMD Epic, which again is the normalized blue and the Graviton 2, which is the hopefully bigger orange, if the orange bar is bigger, the Graviton 2 is performing better. And you're seeing much better performance across the um, across the board. It was on this tea leaf uh, benchmark here that Chris Edsel had some questions. He was concerned that the AMD Epic took a lot longer than we expected, but he's reran it and it's performed the same way a second time. So that gives us a bit more confidence that there is definitely a, a, a better performance there. But as we said, these are provisional, provisional results and we're still um, looking into that. Uh, Brian has piped up in chat and said he can tell us what's happening with the AMD issue later. So yes, thanks, Brian. Uh, after this, it'd be good to, to hear uh, what your explanation is, because I'm sure Chris would be very interested. But regardless, we're seeing better performance on the Graviton 2 compared to the Epics. But with any of this stuff, best thing to do, make a cluster in the cloud, run the benchmarks for your own application and see how the performance differs and choose the right instance type for the kind of work that you're doing. And with that, I am done. So um, you can find out more at our documentation, clusterinthecloud.readthedocs.io. And I'd like to thank AWS, as well as Google and Oracle for supporting development, giving us engineer time, and to the rest of the Bristol RSE team for their contributions and their listening to me complain about stuff um, for the last few years. So thank you all for listening. And I'm happy to take questions if anyone has any. <laughs>